Hey, Jeremy. It's coming in. We're, you're in Chicago. Yep. Did Let's you rock. The Grateful Dead? Did you go to the Grateful Dead concerts? I did not go. There you go. <laughs> Let's rock, though, Prague style. Okay. <laughs> that's going to be the intro. <laughs> there you go. Well, that, that's from Heart of, Heart of the Sunrise by Yes on an album called Fragile, released in 1971. Nice. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders of P90X, Baby Einstein, Atari, many more, how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Today, we have Michael Rose. Is one of, he's one of the world's leading scientists in aging, biological immortality, and human evolution. He's a director and professor at the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology at the University of California, Irvine. He's been doing research for coming on 40 years. He's published over 275 academic publications. He's authored 10 books, including Does Aging Stop? and The Evolutionary Biology of Aging. Michael, thanks for joining me. Thank you, Jeremy. I'm excited, and I always like to include fun facts, and you have a lot of fun facts, including, like we just uh, heard, a huge prog fan uh, for many, many decades. Uh, You've been married four times. You have six kids. Your current wife's a psychiatrist, and she says, what does she say about you? I'll let, I'll let you tell. On a bad day, I'm Sheldon from Big Bang Theory. On a good day, I'm Leonard. <laughs> and that got a good laugh out of her. And, you know, I want to start with um, when we were talking before about you disagree with almost everyone else. Yeah. So explain that. Well, ever since Aristotle, continuing right up to present day major talking heads like Aubrey de Grey, the consensus belief has been that aging is a cumulative physiological process Mm -hmm. of deterioration. The main difference in that school of thought is whether that's accumulated damage or some type of physiological disharmony or even program death. Mm -hmm. And I dissent from that entire point of view completely and utterly. So tell me about that. What... uh What do you believe then? I believe that aging is detuned adaptation. So a simple way to understand that is to say to someone like myself, health is the key signature of adaptation. When we walk around in our early 20s and have tremendous capacity to do physical labor, uh, party hard and get up the next morning and go to class when we're college students, that's a reflection of the level of adaptation uh, evolution by natural selection has given us over the last million or so years. And to me, aging is the progressive loss of such adaptation with adult age. Mm -hmm. Um, A phenomenon that evolutionary theorists explain quite directly and powerfully in terms of the forces of natural selection falling with adult age. So at what point did you, did you start believing that? Was <clears> it from the very beginning you always did, or was it a certain point in your, in your research? So in <clears throat> 1975, John Maynard Smith basically proposed to me, and it was 40 years ago this week, he proposed to me that I, I do my PhD on the idea I just described. Mm-hmm. And when he made that proposal to me, I thought it was the dumbest idea I'd ever heard. And it took him and the man who would also be my graduate advisor, Brian Charlesworth, uh, more than a year to convince me that they were fundamentally correct. And uh, I should explain that John Maynard Smith in his day, was one of the leading biologists of Britain. He won most every award an evolutionary biologist can win. There's a giant biology building at the University of Sussex named after him, and there's even a scholarship named after him. 
he was a leading figure in the British media in the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s. Um, Brian Charlesworth, more of a strict academic than John Maynard Smith, uh, was a Royal Society professor. Um, I don't know if he still is or not. He may have retired this year. He either has just turned 70 or is about to turn 70. And Brian is one of the most powerful intellects who's ever worked in biology. So I had these two really eminent, staggering, brilliant men take more than a year right. of direct, in-your-face <laughs> persuasion, no, no thumbscrews used, right. uh, to try to get me to take that point of view seriously. And finally they succeeded by the fall of 1976, and off I embarked on what will next year be 40 years of experimental work in this field. What convinced you in that year? Math. I worked through the math. Mm -hmm. um, it's math like E equals MC squared. Yeah. It's real math. Not, not, frankly, the cartoony to lame math that biologists often use to entertain, convince, or delude themselves with. This is very hardcore math from first principles. Um, it's math that people still work on. Uh, my closest colleague, Larry Muller, has a graduate student right now, Kevin Fung, who's still working on this body of mathematics. It's a body of mathematics that's like relativity theory. Yeah. So I want to go and talk about your research, Michael, a little bit. But before that, I'm curious, growing up, what did you want to be? Oh, I wanted to be a scientist. You did? Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, by the age of nine, I really wanted to be a scientist. Uh, there were a few moments of weakness after that where I thought, well, maybe a physician. But, you know, I recovered from those moments of weakness. So I've spent the last uh, 40 years living out the dreams of my nine-year-old self. And yeah. at that point, what did, what did you envision as a scientist? What did you want to study? <clears throat> when I was nine years old, what I probably liked best was astrophysics. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I was very impressed with astronomy, and I had this giant book by Fred Hoyle, a very famous 20th century astronomer, astrophysicist, called Astronomy, and lots of pictures, and uh, that got me totally infatuated with uh, not only astronomy, but also science, because in that book, Fred Hoyle explained different theories, firstly of the solar system, going from the traditional geocentric model to the Copernican model, and then he also explained everything up to and including the Big Bang Theory, which he was not a fan of. Um, from there, I progressed to university textbooks on uh, physics and astronomy when I was 10. Uh, when I was 10, I built a planetarium, you know, out of parts that were supplied to me by a hobby store. Um, when I went to high school, um, when I was 12, because they kicked me out of middle school, um, I, I was interested in all the sciences, yeah. but as I, as I went through, I really focused more on biology, and I think that's mostly because I had excellent biology teachers and terrible physics teachers. My chemistry teacher was about in the middle, um, and that, that inclined me toward biology, so I went to college as a biology major in 1971. Nice. And so did your parents do something in the sciences, or? Not at, at all. No. So for, for most of my family, my, my scientific career has been variously um, an embarrassment or a butt of jokes. Uh, <laughs> what did your parents do? Uh, my father was a military officer, and then he became what in the rest of the Anglosphere is called a Mandarin, what you guys in America would call a senior civil servant. Mm -hmm. um, he left government service and soon thereafter became involved in a quango, another word you don't use in the United States, uh, which means a quasi-autonomous non-governmental organization, which nonetheless serves the purpose of a government. Um, so like NPR, National Public Radio, would be a quango. Mm. Okay. So they recognized early on you had this gift for sciences. <laughs> they recognized early on that I had this uh, obsession, which they tried to control. And I remember when I was 11 years old, arguing with my father 
in a bookstore in Montreal where, where I wanted a book on cosmology uh, and my father couldn't understand why on earth I would want such a book. <laughs> That's a reasonable, reasonable thought, actually. Um, so what brought you to Sussex then? Uh, I did my PhD at the University of Sussex yeah. uh, because I turned down Harvard, uh, which um, I was choosing primarily between Harvard and Sussex. Yeah. At Harvard, there were then two of the very leading evolutionary geneticists in the world, Richard Lewinton and Richard Levins. And so Harvard then was just as awesome as it is now, if, if not even more so. Um, and instead of working with them, I went to the University of Sussex to work with John Maynard Smith and Brian Charlesworth, mm -hmm. primarily to avoid the sociobiology controversy at Harvard, which was then so vituperative and destructive that it was being regularly reported on in the news media as an example of academics behaving badly. Hmm. Interesting. I, I described this decision, the first good decision of my life, in my book, The Long Tomorrow. That's how it opens, with me vacillating between Harvard and Sussex. What's the biggest learnings you had when you were at Sussex? Wow. <clears throat> so when I went to Sussex, I'd actually already been doing research for three years, starting as an undergraduate in 1973. Mm -hmm. And I'd done a master's degree at my undergraduate institution, Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario, Canada. So I, I'd already learned how to do science, what yeah. science was about, yeah. um, how to do theory, how to do simple experiments. At Sussex, I feel that I learned how to put it all together, how to make connections between hardcore math and very hardcore experimentation. And um, you, know, you could say I've been coasting on that ever since. Uh, it was it was a truly wonderful intellectual experience. It really was. I, um, it's a decision I will never regret. Um, you should understand that during those three years, I took one vacation, lasted one week. Um, otherwise, I worked, and uh, I had a fabulous time working seven days a week. Um, what were the hours like? Like, were you working late in the evenings, or what? Uh... My, my, my hours would vary from 8 to 24 hours out of 24 hours. Um, so 24 hours? Sure. Oh, yeah. It was, it was not unusual for me to stay up for 36 hours to do my experiments. Because I knew that the most important thing in biology is scalar replication. Mm -hmm. Something that is only now starting to permeate academic biology with the advent of genomics yeah. because genomics is a completely pathetic and ineffective tool if you just sequence one genome even at a thousand genomes you don't really have enough you need a million so just to give people a sense of what did the experiments look like mm -hmm. when you were up for 36 hours what were we doing the number, one, the number one thing you do when you're up for 36 hours is you're collecting virgins and every fly researcher has done this okay <laughs> Okay, so should that I be mean, the title of this interview, "Collecting Virgins," or would that give the wrong idea? That would give the wrong idea. Oh, okay. Uh, another area I've worked on is actually the evolution of sex and parthenogenesis. I read that. Yeah. By virgins. Um, happy to talk with you on some other occasion about that, but that's even weirder than my work on aging. That's too bad because I had a question about that on here. So oh, yeah, you don't want to get into that. I don't know. I think I do. But um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so what does that mean, collecting virgins? For, for so, someone who doesn't know, yeah. So a fruit fly female yeah. emerges from a pupil case, somewhat like a butterfly emerges from a chrysalis. Mm -hmm. And in the case of a female fruit fly, at the kind of room temperatures we work at, she's going to stay a virgin for at least five hours. Many of my colleagues count on six. I don't. I go with five. Mm -hmm. So that means if you have a whole bunch of female flies can be emerging over a period of 36 hours, you basically have to be collecting them, start collecting them in rounds every five hours. And it can take an hour and a half to two hours to sex the flies and separate the males from the females yeah. so that your females will actually be virgins. So that's just one way you can stay up for 36 hours straight. I, I've had graduate students who've broken through that limit by far. I had one graduate student once stay up for more than 70 hours straight. Wow. 
collecting virgins. Well, uh, <laughs> um, then you went on to Madison. I went into Madison, Wisconsin yeah. for a postdoc. Which I went to school in Madison. Yeah. Awesome city. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, love it. And uh, there I was a student of the late James F. Crow. And uh, he was my postdoctoral advisor. But what I was actually doing was sneaking down to Sewell Wright's office two floors down. Mm. Now, Sewell Wright is... Um, Many of us believe the greatest American biologist of the 20th century. Really? That includes, by comparison, Jim Watson, Thomas Hunt Morgan, and everyone else you would care to name. Mm-hmm. Um, Sewell Wright was an intellect on the same scale as Isaac Newton or Albert Einstein. Wow. He was one of the three most brilliant biologists who've ever lived, the other two being J.B.S. Haldane and R. A. Fisher, and I academically descend from all three. Mm-hmm. That's amazing. Uh, so Sewell Wright was my uncle at University of Wisconsin Madison, uh, where James F. Crow was playing a paternal role. Um, mm-hmm. I'm a, a grandchild of J. B. S. Haldane because I'm a student of John Maynard Smith, who was a student of J. B. S. Haldane, mm. and I'm a great grandchild of R. A. Fisher, um, who was the most important figure for a man called Thode, who is the advisor to another one of my advisors, Brian Charlesworth, who is my most important advisor in my PhD. So I'm connected to all three of them, but I got to hang out primarily with Sewell Wright um, when he was about 90 years old and still so brilliant that he would speak to you in perfect sentences and paragraphs when you would ask him a question. So tell me about some of those conversations, Michael. Well, the key to those conversations for me, I mean, he said many things that were just breathtakingly brilliant. Um, But he led me away from the primary focus of my doctoral research, which was quantitative genetics, toward a field which then didn't really have a name. But I've been one of those who's helped name it, which is a field called experimental evolution. Mm-hmm. And experimental evolution is an approach which is spreading throughout biology. Um, in the 1970s, when I first started doing it, there were probably less than 10 people in the world who did it. Mm-hmm. Now there are hundreds. Um, and experimental evolution, to those of us who do it, is biology done right. Uh, biology where you control the ancestry of your organisms, where you mm-hmm. control how they evolve in your hands. Mm-hmm where you control their population sizes, where you directly or indirectly control their genetic variation. It's, in a sense, biology fully controlled in the same sense that people like Lavoisier in the late 18th century argued chemistry should be done. It's, it's only taken us around 200 years to catch up with the chemists, as far as experimental evolutionists are concerned. Mm-hmm. To experimental evolutionists, almost all biology experiments are not even as good as stamp collecting um, because they don't properly control enough variables Mm -hmm. to do with the biological material. So most biologists work with inbred garbage. They don't even know how it was inbred. Um, Then they do things like impose mutations on them or cross them with mutant stocks. Um, They get their mutations usually at random, though CRISPR will change that, the new technology. And then they're doing these little experiments um, on a vastly too small scale. And then they're telling stories about their results based on, frankly, pretty good reasoning circa 1920, genetic reasoning that comes from T.H. Morgan, um, the founder of experimental Mendelian genetics. And that kind of work is only adequate for less than 5% of what's interesting in biology. Now, in the 20th century, a huge amount of progress was used with, sorry, a huge amount of progress was achieved with that strategy. And that's how we worked out some of the basic uh, rules of the chromosomal mechanics of inheritance, sex determination, and many other things. So it was a great first step. Mm -hmm. I don't don't want people to 
regret 20th century biology, even though since 1999 it's hopelessly outmoded. Um, and experimental evolution together with genomics, in the view of people like myself, now in the hundreds, is the key to further advances in biology, not trivially, most especially including aging. Yeah, I mean, he must have said something pretty profound about experimental evolution to make you change okay. what you were doing. So he did two things. Firstly, I had this really cool plan of research in mind for quantitative genetics, and he basically demolished that plan mm. in a completely convincing way. Mm -hmm. And secondly, at the same time I was speaking with Sewell Wright, I was reading his four-volume magnum opus, which summarized not only his career, but much of the last century of biological research as it then was in 1980. Mm -hmm. And basically, those four volumes amount to a case for creating a field that we have, in fact, since created called experimental evolution. Mm -hmm. And I'm one of dozens of people who immediately read those books and went, wow, we have to do what we now call experimental evolution mm -hmm. because most everything else we would do won't be good enough. And that's been the core of my career as an experimentalist mm -hmm. ever since January of 1980. Yeah. So after you decide, he convinces you to do that, what mm -hmm. changed with what you were doing? Okay. So the first thing is I realized that quantitative genetics was nowhere near as powerful as I had hoped it would be. Mm -hmm. As indeed many biologists then were hoping. The 1980s was an era when evolutionary biologists especially looked to quantitative genetics as a key technology. Starting in the late 80s into the early 90s, that was a hope taken on by many biologists with technologies like QTL, quantitative trait loci, and even GWAS, which is the most fashionable genomic technology right now, genome-wide association studies. It's fundamentally based on quantitative genetics. And uh, Sewell Wright in late 1979 convinced me that that was a dead end, chiefly because of the lack of statistical power. Mm -hmm. Because Sewell Wright was one of the founders of modern statistical research. He created uh, path analysis. Um, he was one of the, together with R.A. Fisher, one of the leading figures in the development of multivariate data analysis. Yeah. So next after Madison, so you go to Canada, right? You become a professor yeah. in Canada? Yeah, I'm Canadian. Yeah. Out of the closet. You go back to your, are. Back to your roots. I'd never lived in Halifax, yeah. which is where the university I went to yeah. was. Halifax is a wonderful city. Canada has many absolutely wonderful cities to live in for at least two months of the year. Exactly. July and August. That's how Chicago is. Yes. I can relate. Uh, no, 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 no. Chicago summers are too hot and sweaty. No, no, no. In, in Canada, you're mostly, uh, except for Toronto, you're mostly to the north of too hot and sweaty in July and August. Mm -hmm. So July and August from Victoria and Vancouver on the West Coast to Halifax on the East Coast, those two months, Canada is paradise, okay? And uh, the rest of the Canadian year is, you know, a climatic disaster. Uh, you go from harsh and unpredictable fall and spring to predictably Arctic winter. Uh, except for Vancouver and Victoria, where they skip the predictably Arctic winter. But you still get the, the harsh spring and fall by the standards of where I now live, which is Southern California. So Halifax is actually a, a, a wonderful, wonderful city. Um, and uh, if I could handle the Canadian winter, it would be a great place to retire to. Uh, while I was there from 1981 to 1987, um, I got to build up... Uh, experimental evolution yeah. in my lab and in general. Um, and I also, uh, at that time, for a period of about six years, I actually worked on a number of different topics, mm -hmm. not just aging. I also worked on speciation, the origin and uh, maintenance of sex, um, and human evolution as well. Um, and I was lured away from uh, Canada to the United States, back to the United States, mm -hmm. by a combination of multiple things. Uh, one was the opportunity to get funding on a scale of 
10 to 100 times greater than I had in Canada, mm. to have vastly more colleagues in my own department. The department I was in in Canada was a very good department. Um, Just smaller? But, well, smaller in my field. Mm. So I now am in a department of <clears throat> about 40 ecologists and evolutionary biologists. Yeah. Your normal biology department has two to four such people. Yeah. Um, Some more resources and people, yeah. Oh, yeah. So, you know, so the key to understanding the United States' great success in science and technology is firstly scale. Yeah. And secondly, the fact that the United States buys many of its best scientists, engineers, and technologists from other countries. And that's, I mean, you can start with Einstein and go down from there. So what were some of the breakthroughs you were seeing when you were still, before you came to the U.S.? Mm -hmm. What were you seeing in, in your Canadian research labs? So in the 1970s, I did a little pilot experiment which suggested that aging could predictably evolve in a lab to produce much longer-lived organisms. Mm -hmm. And I did that on a scale where I got you know, maybe 15 to 20 percent increases in lifespan in one selected line. In fruit flies, you're talking. In fruit flies. Yeah, okay. And my entire experimental career in, is about fruit flies. So whatever I say about experiments, it means in fruit flies, okay. Drosophila melanogaster. Though we have dallied in other Drosophila species as well, mm -hmm. mostly Drosophila melanogaster. And it's the lab fruit fly that back in the day, in the 60s and 70s, uh, high school students in the United States used to do experiments with. Not so much anymore, but back in the day. Yeah. Uh, so when I was at Dalhousie University in Canada in the early 80s, I basically showed that you could reproducibly, with multiple populations, produce longer-lived organisms. And we started pushing that, and it didn't matter how hard we pushed, the flies would just live longer and longer and longer and longer which basically said that you know there are no physiological breaks on producing a ma much longer lived organism. Uh, evolution doesn't resist producing Methuselah organisms, it just doesn't normally bother to because mm -hmm. that's not what it's focused on um, in terms of the forces of natural selection. So um, by 1983, just two years into my days in back in Canada, I was already being contacted by American universities about coming to them, to their departments, and basically UC Irvine won that competition, and they offered to hire me by early 1985, and then it took them two and a half years for me to get a green card to arrive in Southern California mm -hmm. in the summer of 1987, where I have since remained. So for you, when you increased the lifespan by 15 to 20 percent were you happy with that were you impressed with that did you what what were you what were your expectations let me put this in context yeah um i did that experiment without even telling my doctoral advisor i was doing it he'd gone away to north carolina on sabbatical and the reason why i didn't tell him is he like most every other biologist in the world didn't think an experiment like that would work because he thought you'd have to wait too long for rare mutations mm -hmm. that would give you increased lifespan. But my quantitative genetic work was already suggesting to me at least that in fact an experiment like this would work. What I was reading of the literature, uh, published literature, at that time suggested to me people had almost done this experiment already. So I thought, what the hell? I'm going to try this. <laughs> so I tried it as a complete skunk works secret project and my advisor only really heard about it when he came back from the United States. And I'll never forget the day I walked up to his office with a lab book's worth of data where I could show him uh, the results from this experiment and how beautiful and powerful they were. It was it's like, I, to me, the day was like two days ago. Uh, that's how strong it is in my memory. And I'll never forget, he scratched the side of his head, Brian Charlesworth, and he said, well, that's it then. Because you realize that nothing was going to be the same again for the study of aging. Because what I'd done in that experiment yeah. on a very small scale was show that evolution was the complete and utter master of aging and not anything to do with telomeres, mitochondria, 
um, cumulative damage, um, lipofuscin. Pick your molecular cellular mechanism. Mm. I have a simple way of explaining this now, which is to say, you know, it's an important thing, Jeremy, for all your listeners to understand is there are lots of organisms of every kind except vertebrates that do not age at all. Mm -hmm. You know, there are sea anemones, which are multicellular animals. Some species of sea anemones do not age at all. There are trees that do not age at all, trembling aspen. There are shrubs that you see uh, routinely, like juniper, don't age. It goes on and on and on. Mm. And those organisms, like sea anemones, have the same basic cell and molecular biology that we do. They have linear chromosomes. They have telomeres. They have all the same mm -hmm. mitochondria. They have all the same sources of molecular damage. Don't age. Why not? Because evolution says, hell no, I don't want you to age because you're the kind of organism which evolutionary biologists call a fissile organism that splits exactly in two when reproduction occurs. So if evolution were to let those organisms age, the species would go extinct. Mm -hmm. So because evolution is the all-powerful master of life, you know, it's really the deity, if you will. Um, it says basically, zap, you're not going to age. If there's a mutation that occurs in any one of your lineages which causes aging, it will go to extinction. And the only surviving fissile sea anemones are the ones that do not age at all. And in effect, what I was doing with the fruit, fl fruit flies was a microcosmic god version of what evolution has done over millions of years mm -hmm. for fissile sea anemones. I was saying, okay, fruit flies, slow down the aging. Okay, stop it. St don't do that aging thing. Wait for it. Wait for it. No, no, not yet. Not yet. Don't start aging until after you have your first shot at reproduction. And my doing that experiment actually comes directly from the math that I was learning 40 years ago in the process of convincing me to go to Sussex to work on aging with Maynard Smith and Brian Charlesworth. Yeah. It comes directly from those equations, just like the atomic bomb comes directly from E equals MC squared, mm -hmm. where directly in both cases means you have to really understand the equation, then you have to think about how you're going to make things work. Uh, and thinking about how you're going to make things work with the atomic bomb took about 12, 15 years from the early mm -hmm. 1930s to 1945. Didn't take that long in my case, but I like, you know, Oppenheimer and the other people in the Manhattan Project was playing off of a fairly simple equation of huge power. Right. Huge power. Hamilton's forces of natural selection are to aging as E equals MC squared is to the sun, mm -hmm. nuclear weapons, and the nature of the universe. Yeah. Michael, this is... Um, and I was basically the, the lucky person who figured out how to exploit those equations. It's, you know, this is heavy stuff. I'm gonna have to go back and watch this about ten times to really, Sorry. to really have it sink in, because there's so many questions that come up. It's really too bad we have the the limited time we have. Because I want to ask you about what you saw at that time was the bearing on human life. But I mean, mm. the question that I'm not gonna ask, but I want to because it will <laughs> it'll take us off in so many different directions, which is okay. which brings up the origin of life. I, I would love to hear your views at some we're, time of the origin of life. We're not going there. We're not no, going we're not going there now. <laughs> I'm just throwing it out there. Okay. And 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 also brings up the questions of the evolution of sex thing too, which is a, a whole nother discussion. Yes. But I, I so want to go to the origin of life with you, but I'm just going to hang with... Origin of life and origin of sex and yeah. sex. Those are all intimately related topics. Yeah. We can do an hour on those some other time. Yeah, so I'm, I'm going to hold back, but I just wanted to throw it out there so I remember to ask about it. But okay. at that point, when you discovered this, what did you see on the bearing of human life then, mm -hmm. and what do you see now? Right. That, that, that is, I would say, the multi-billion dollar question. Right, right. Um, so I spent my first uh, eight years working on aging its evolution, and actually manipulating it in my lab without thinking seriously about the possibility of that having any relevance to human aging. Mm -hmm. In 1984, I was asked to write a popular article by New Scientist magazine in England on evolution of aging. So I wrote up a, frankly, not very well written in the sense of not very accessible article on my research and research of my inspirations 
like William Hamilton and Brian Charlesworth, for them and sent it off. And they came back basically saying, no, 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 no. This is not what we want. They said, firstly, most importantly, you have to give us a scenario by which we can use these ideas to change human aging. Mm -hmm. And my answer was, I've never thought of anything like that. And they basically said, well, now you have to. <laughs> so I thought hard, and I came up with the first strategy I developed for postponing human aging, yeah. which was a fairly, you know, in retrospect, unimaginative extrapolation from my own work, mm -hmm. which was to apply my uh, evolutionary delayed breeding strategy, which I had used to produce longer-lived fruit flies. Right. To mice. Okay. That's what I proposed in this article published in 1984. Mm -hmm. They changed the title. They made the title The Evolutionary Route to Methuselah. Ignoring 90% of the article, which was on evolutionary biology of aging, and focusing on the last 5 or 10%, which is what might we do for people. I then spent 15 years trying to convince people to do that experiment. And there was actually a lab in Canada, in Ottawa, Ontario, mm -hmm. the experimental farm there, which did a pilot of that experiment with mice. And it worked. They produced longer-lived mice by using the basic strategy I proposed in my 84 article, which I had published on since 1980 in scientific journals. So you proposed at this point you should delay reproduction in mice. To, to, is that what? Over multiple generations mm -hmm. to make them evolve longer lifespans mm -hmm. so that we could then reverse engineer how evolution did it to try to figure out how to uh, control mammalian aging because we're mammals, mm -hmm. um, not fruit flies. Right. You know, they're great regretted Drosophila researchers. Um, so at the time in 1984, if you'd asked your regular biologist on the street, uh, how many of the genes in a fruit fly do you think there are also in a human genome, they would probably give you an answer between 10% and 25%. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so at that time, we really thought that a fruit fly was a pretty poor model for a mammal. Fast forward 15 years to 1999, and I'm sitting at a closed little aging group meeting on actually developing interventions in human aging. And I was suddenly and overwhelmingly struck with a completely different strategy for uh, postponing human aging. Because by then it was starting to become apparent in 1999, uh, the year we got the complete sequence of the fruit fly genome, mm that within a few years we would have uh, the human genome sequenced, which was really done be by 2001, not 2000 as it was announced by that dude Bill Clinton who happened to live in this White House in Washington, D.C. Um, uh, and I realized that once we had both genomes, we could easily check any fruit fly results in humans and mm -hmm. we could skip the mouse. So at the time I, I was thinking, you know, maybe 40 to 60 percent of the fruit fly genome connects up with the human genome in terms of similar genes and pathways. Mm -hmm. And that, over the next uh, seven years or so, led to a company called Genesient. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and by that time, we had both the fly genome and the human genome. And so Genesient started to work on genomic tricks for figuring out what were the genes involved in producing much greater lifespans in my fruit flies. Mm -hmm. um, which by then were living more than twice as long as the fruit flies from which they were derived. I mean, you know, how would you like to that's live huge. 150, yeah. Jeremy? That's huge, yeah. And the idea was, well, how many of the genes that are involved in that are also involved in human health and function? Right. There are different ways through that calculation, uh, which those calculations were done inside the company. <clears throat> and the answer is nothing like the answer I would have thought in 84. Mm -hmm. The answer was 75 to 80, 85%. Wow. So a much longer-lived fruit fly turns out to be an awesome sketch for a much longer-lived human. Right. And 
with genomic tools, you can easily go from any result in a fruit fly to humans. Right. And in particular, you can compare results from human data, like GWAS data, with GWAS or other studies in fruit flies and check. You don't have to guess. You can check. Is, does the fruit fly gene, in fact, inform us as to the genetic foundations of human aging? And the answer is pretty overwhelmingly the large majority of the time over and over again. So really, at that time, in, from 1999 to uh, 2009, this was my second idea for how we could directly intervene in human aging was by going from fruit fly genomics of postponed aging to the human genomic foundations of aging. So what do we do as humans to two times our, our lifespan? Well, actually, in 2009, I had an even better idea. Mm -hmm. Jeremy? Let's, let's hear it. <laughs> and the even better idea came from uh, working on... Uh, a very tricky, weird little piece of evolutionary genetic theory, which we're still working on uh, with math and computers, <clears throat> uh, but we've checked it in experiments with fruit flies, and that is basically that when a population adapts to a new environment, it's like one of those giant uh, ladder fire trucks going around a corner. Okay. Which is, you can easily steer the front part of the fire truck, the fire engine around the corner. The problem is your huge, gigantic, lagging tail that has swings the giant ladders right. swings way out. It's very hard to get it to corner right. Well, that's in general true of species that have undergone a major environmental change in their recent evolutionary history. And you and I happen to know such a species very well, and that's humans. Up until 12,000 years ago, very, very few populations subsided on the products of agriculture. Things like wheat, oats, barley, rice, cow milk, cheese, yogurt, and so on. Yeah. Starting around that time in the Fertile Crescent of Eurasia, populations started to become agricultural. Not insignificantly, this totally messed up their health. Yeah. It messed up their uh, skeletal development, it messed up their stature, it probably messed up their IQ. Um, they were a mess, but they were alive, which yeah. is always a struggle for hunter-gatherer population. In a sense, going agricultural gave them a secure source of food. Um, so that then spread around the world. But 10,000 generations isn't that many, sorry, 10,000 years isn't that many human generations. It's in the hundreds. Right, right. Um, now, that's more than enough time, contrary to some paleo-enthusiasts, to really effectively adapt young people, which means 30 and under, to this new diet. So, you know, 20-year-olds who have Eurasian ancestry are very well adapted to uh, a whole bunch of grass species like wheat, barley, oats. Mm -hmm. Those of us from the um, western end of Eurasia, Europe, uh, where we've had dairy, um, you've had I see. cattle, husbandry, yeah. Yeah. and goats for thousands of years, are very well adapted to dairy as well. Yeah. Everywhere else in the world, not as much. Um, but like the tail end of the fire truck, at later ages, mm. we don't have that adaptation right. to those novel foods, and it continuously fades out starting sometime in your late 20s mm -hmm. for your average person. Now, because evolution is an aggregate population level process, there will still be some individuals even with like Dutch ancestry who will have crappy health when they're 14 on dairy foods. Right. Because it's a few hundred generations, it's still early days, but they're the exception rather than the rule. By the time you get to be my age, 60, you've effectively lost adaptation to dairy foods, grass-derived foods. Really? Legume-derived. Yeah, it's gone. And you uh, have all kinds of chronic health problems from heart disease to cancer that arise from the chronic inflammatory syndromes 
that are created when you feed an animal every day of its life the wrong food. Mm -hmm. um, my extreme example of this is the cat fed a vegan diet. That is a messed up and soon dying cat. Mm -hmm. Okay? Yeah. So a human from anywhere in the world over the age of 60 consuming an agricultural diet, even an organic Andrew Weil, healthy agricultural diet, yeah. is like a vegan cat. We are sick and dying. So I basically said to my closest friends, wow, we do this and we're going to transform our health. And a few of my nerdiest um, friends and myself, we started to do this. And it works amazingly well. You adopted like more of a paleo type of diet, is what you're saying. I, I adopted, I think, a scientifically correct paleo, not a caricature, cartoon, bow and arrow, meat three times a day mm -hmm. paleo diet. A paleo diet includes everything from insect grubs, which I don't eat, but think shrimp, to uh, lots of fruit, lots of vegetables, um, lots of nuts, lots of eggs, and sometimes meat. Yeah. No dairy, so, no wheat zero products. Dairy, zero wheat products rice right. soy go down that list yeah yeah so i actually don't recommend that diet for people under 30 unless mm. they have some very specific signatures yeah like massive dairy and meat allergies right. that would be a little signal your body saying <laughs> hey i'm not adapted to this stuff could you please stop giving it to me right um so that's my third idea so what did you find and you said you got your mm -hmm. your you and your nerdiest friends to do this what happened Everybody who's done it as hardcore as I've done it has basically gone back in physiological time at least 10 years. Wow. The range is 10 to 20 years. Um, one person I persuaded uh, of this, a man called Peter Turchin, I hope you won't mind my using his name, but he does post on this in his blog. No. Um, he went from your classic decrepit Euro-style, puffy, inflamed academic to... <laughs> frankly, a sleek, athletic-looking beast. Wow. <laughs> In the course of, of uh, about a year, it was like an yeah. amazing transformation. And uh, uh, Peter's an amazing human being in many ways. But, I mean, I was startled because I gave him this advice in around the spring of, I think it was 2011, mm -hmm. uh, might have been 2012. And one year later, I visited him in Connecticut and he completely transformed himself. Wow. It was mind-blowing. Uh, I won't claim I've made that much progress. Um, uh, when my friends uh, are being nice to me, they say, oh, Michael, you, you look like you're in your 40s. Um, true. I'll go, yeah, true though, ma yeah, maybe on a good day. Yeah, it's true. Uh, uh, but um, I certainly feel like I felt uh, 10 or 15 years ago. Yeah. And uh, a whole bunch of health measures have improved. I used to have really severe upper GI tract problems. I had lots of metaplastic tissue in my esophagus. Mm. Uh, I would receive regular endoscopies, yeah. and which were terrifying to look at uh, because I had Chatsky rings. Like precancerous from exactly. the acid reflux. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And mass I had stomach ulcers. I just. Horrible. Yes. That's from staying up 36 hours at a time, but yeah. Uh, beg your pardon? I, I, was, I was saying it's from staying up and never sleeping for 36 hours at a time. Yeah. No, because after changing my diet, um, in the last six months, I had a complete uh, wow. upper GI endoscopy, and it's almost completely clean now. That's amazing. So I'm very grateful because basically I was on the high road to getting stomach or esophageal cancer. Mm which is what my father died of two years ago. Oh, really? Wow. I'm so sorry. Yeah. Jeez. So, so that would have been me. I mean, to be honest with you, if I hadn't had that idea about six years ago, I really doubt that I'd be alive today. So, it's amazing. Um, well, it's only amazing if you don't take hardcore scientific theory seriously. If you take E equals MC squared seriously that you could make an atomic bomb is in one sense amazing because wow that's a big explosion but in another sense it's completely not amazing because E equals mc squared c is the speed of light that number squared is a gigantic number that says you convert just a small number of grams of uranium into energy 
you expect an astronomically big explosion. So the point here is, everything I've been doing for 40 years derives from Hamilton's forces of natural selection, which again are to aging exactly like e equals mc squared. Those of us who understand those equations and use them in our daily experimental work know these are the most powerful equations in the entire field of aging research. People who don't understand them are like people trying to build atomic bombs in their backyard using bleach and other supplies they get from a hardware store. Mm -hmm. It's sad and pathetic. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. But it would be like people charged with the task of building a gigantic bomb in the 1940s for the Allied powers, but only using Newtonian physics and chemistry. They really couldn't do what the nuclear physicists could do. Mm -hmm. Because they didn't have the right science, not even close. That is the deal that separates me from Aubrey, whom I love as a propagandist. He's like totally indispensable. Or Bill Andrews or any one of the tens of thousands of people around the world who hope to conquer aging using ideas that go date back to Aristotle and that have essentially been destroyed by the last uh, 40 years of research on aging by people like myself. How did you come up with the distinction there of at a certain time period, you can now, you know, before like age 40 or 35, it's mm -hmm. fine to have the dairy and mm -hmm. the, the wheat, um, mm -hmm. and then after not. And then two, like let's say your child now, because mm -hmm. they were born later, when they're mm -hmm. past 40, are they going to be fine because they've had more time to adapt? Or you no, know, they no. were born later? Do you know what I mean? Like yeah, it, that's a common misunderstanding, yeah. Jeremy. Uh, to produce a much longer-lived organism by evolution takes dozens to hundreds of generations. Sure. It's not something done in one generation of reproducing later. Yeah. Um, so it's not an immediate effect. So if you look at the data from fruit fly evolution experiments, it takes about 10 generations of delayed breeding to produce an effect. And then it accumulates. The more generations after that, the farther back you can push aging. So we now have flies that are, uh, have a prolonged adult period before aging ever starts. Mm -hmm. They got no aging for the first few weeks of their life at all. Um, so, but it's not something that you can give your children by reproducing later. Mm -hmm. It's nothing like that. Mm -hmm. Now, wh where does the idea of 30 or 40 come from? Yeah. Well, y you can pretty much plot forces of natural selection acting on human populations. And Hamilton actually did this in 1966 in his landmark publication, where he first derived the forces of natural selection mathematically. And natural selection in human populations stays really quite strong into our 20s. And then it kind of falls off a cliff. And... Uh, you know, by our, our late 30s. So we really actually have a pretty good guarantee that people with long agricultural ancestry um, are going to be pretty well adapted to eating dairy and grass-derived foods into their 30s. And uh, around the age of 40, when you first start to, you know, lose your ability to sustain concentration, when you don't have the physical stamina you had, when you don't have the peerless digestion that you might have had as a you know, 20 year old kid in college surviving on Coke and pizza. Um, right. you know, it's around when you're 40 that Coke and pizza kills you, right? <laughs> right. Coke and pizza for a meal and it's like, oh, what did I just do to myself? Right. And that's when you enter you know, the Hamiltonian zone of having to revert back in time. I see, yeah. And it's not, an, as I was trying to indicate earlier, it's not exact. So some sure. unfortunate people are going to be suffering from an agricultural diet in their yeah. teens. Yeah. And other fortunate people might be good into their 50s. Yeah. But on average, it's going to be somewhere in middle age. Yeah. And what I've seen with my friends who've mostly done this transition in their 50s, like as I did, right. is the benefits are really staggering. I mean, they're obvious. You, you get a, a physiological reversal in terms of your day-to-day -day functioning, on the scale of a decade, mm. at least. That's amazing, yeah. If you're strict about it.
So when you were saying you're bringing up Aubrey de Grey and Bill Andrews and mm. um, Immortalists. Immortalists. So when you're sitting around the table, you're friends with Bill. When you're sitting around the table at dinner, mm -hmm. tell me what that debate looks like. Because obviously, because of his research and what he's doing, he's going to, you know, may disagree with your statement and you're going to disagree with his. What, what does that conversation look like? Um, so up until the 1990s, when something really radical happened, which I can get to. Go ahead, yeah. Um, most people, myself included, by the way, so I was, I was with Bill, uh, felt that what people like Bill were doing with telomeres was part of the aging story. Mm -hmm. And that what the work that I did was basically saying, this is why evolution by natural selection lets those physiological processes destroy us. Okay? Because mm -hmm. it's a simple verbal interpretation to say that Hamilton's forces of natural selection are the explanation for why the house falls apart, the call for, car falls apart, or the telomeres get shaved off progressively. Right. And therefore, what we need to do is to go after each of those physiological processes and stop or curtail them, which is pretty much what Aubrey de Grey thinks. Um, interestingly, Aubrey and Bill completely disagree with each other about telomeres. Aubrey thinks they're... Uh, Telomere rescue is dangerous, and Bill thinks it's the key. I think they're both wrong. Um, so, the radical thing that happened in the early 1990s, which struck me sideways, uh, was the discovery in the lab by uh, two labs, actually, independently. Jim Carey's lab, uh, University of California, Davis, and Jim Kurtzinger's lab, University of Minnesota, is they discovered that if you have a gigantic cohort of organisms, and they both use flies, one fruit flies, one med flies, if you have a gigantic cohort, and that might mean hundreds of thousands to millions, aging stops demographically, and mortality rates stabilize. A result like this was published in 1939 based on human data, and no one believed it. Not even the authors. They thought, something's weird here. That is so uh, weird, yeah. And indeed, it's very weird. It's a black hole-like effect, to again revert to relativistic mechanics by way of a parallel. It's like so weird, you like, can't, could this ever really happen? So, you know, the mathematics of relativity theory allowed for black holes, but when that mathematics was developed, it was unimaginable to anyone that that would happen. Yeah. That came later. And interestingly, Carey and Kurtzinger argued that their discovery of the cessation of aging in late life indicated that everybody had been wrong about aging, even people like myself. Mm -hmm. And I took that seriously. Sure. And, and uh, I raised questions about some of their experimental designs, but I knew that at least some of their experiments had to be right. Mm -hmm. So I then spent about two and a half years thinking hard about this. And I got Larry Muller, my normal partner in crime, to do some extensive uh, hardcore numerical work pushing evolutionary theory farther than it had ever been pushed before mm -hmm. in terms of Hamilton's forces of natural selection. And in 1996, we published a paper where we showed that, in fact, an expanded version of Hamilton's theory, somewhat analogous to the transition from special relativity to general relativity, not the same thing, but analogous to it, when you push out to later ages, in fact, the forces of natural selection stop declining. Hmm. And that cessation in their decline produces a cessation of demographic aging. And we then worked on that, those ideas for another 15 years, leading to the book Does Aging Stop? Right. Which is this, to me, beautiful combination of math and data, um, very much in the spirit of early 20th century physicists, where we show, in fact... Aging was even weirder than we thought before 1990. Even all the evolutionary biologists. The fact that aging could stop meant that the whole interpretation that I had been that I had been accepting, that my work as an evolutionist was showing why evolution let aging proceed physiologically to the point of destruction, 
mm-hmm. was wrong. That interpretation was wrong. The math shows that aging is just a transient decline in adaptation between two periods of relatively stable adaptation, the period of development before the start of aging, and the period of late life after the end of aging, which in humans on an organic agricultural diet is around age 90 on. And the really amazing thing is that perhaps humans on a paleo diet, their aging will stop in their mid-70s. Hmm or earlier. And on the paleo transition that I talk about, um, you do so with better health. Right. So if in fact we can use this dietary and lifestyle manipulation to get people to routinely stop aging at the chronological age of 70 years, but the physiological age of 55 years, Mm -hmm. then aging is completely transformed. Yeah. Because with modern day medicine, you can keep a robust 55 year old alive for a very long time mm-hmm. because they can survive um, heart valve replacement surgery. They can survive uh, chemotherapy. They can survive the extirpation of an organ mm, as long as they have yeah. a spare organ. Like you can lose one kidney but keep the other. Right. Or you can give them a liver transplant. Then you're looking at the approach of indefinite lifespans. Mm hmm. Now, having said all of that, yeah. we, of course, want better technology for dealing with aging-associated diseases, right. like heart disease, like cancer. Yeah. Uh, so my present view is that we're 50 to 70 years away from completely figuring out the vast genomic complexity of the entire aging package. Mm-hmm. But what we can do is, firstly, stabilize our aging using a paleo transition in middle age. Mm -hmm. Then secondly, use conventional medicine to patch, repair, replace the bits and pieces of our bodies that are either gunked up or tumorous to greatly extend functional human lifespan and approach something like Aubrey's idea of an escape velocity, Mm -hmm. such that by the end of this century, we will be working toward humans that live centuries instead of a century if you're lucky. Yeah. I do think that people who follow my advice now and are, you know, about your age, Jeremy, uh, could easily live to be 110, 120, and your children could easily live to be 150 or 200, mm-hmm. and it would be cumulative. A uh, simple metric of this uh, is between 1900 and the 1990s, the number of deaths in Western industrial countries like the United States or England due to infectious disease was cut by 90%. Well, yeah. So in 1900, major causes of death were tuberculosis, pneumonia, and influenza. Yeah. In the 1990s, they were minor causes of death, still potential causes of death yeah. in industrialized countries but an order of magnitude less. Yeah. So my prediction is that in this century, the 21st, we'll go from uh, the situation circa the year 2000, where 70 to 75% of all deaths are clearly aging associated, like progressive heart disease, cancer, and so on, to a situation where 7 to 10% of deaths in the year 2100 will be clearly aging associated. The same thing we did with infectious yeah. disease in the 20th century. Yeah. So at that point in time, your biggest health risks are driving three ways. Yeah. And um, Michael, we're right at the hour. Um, so I want to respect your time because what you just said brings up about 10 other questions that I have. So I'm not going to ask them, but I'm going to throw one out, not to have you answer it, but just so I remember it. You know, that brings up, like, from what you just said, obviously the paleo transition diet is huge and so what brings up to me is well what else besides the paleo transition will help halt aging and then from reading all your works obviously well right now maybe halting aging could be at 110 or 130 but we don't know because we're not there so how do we get to the halting aging like you said at 70 or 50 so that we can have that sustainable okay you know uh i i failed to convey something yeah so 
I was switching between the age at which aging stops and the age at which you die. So you understand that uh, certainly European women on an organic agricultural diet like Jeanne Calment stop aging in the early 90s, mm -hmm. but their likelihood of dying in any one year mm. is between 35 and 40 percent. Jeanne Calment lived to 122 because she got lucky every year. Really. Mm. She beat the odds every year. But those women in whom aging stops uh, in their 90s when they eat an organic agricultural diet, right. as they probably still do in rural France, have stopped aging, but they will die because they're at a high mortality rate. Mm -hmm. So my dietary lifestyle uh, advice doesn't end the risk of dying, including dying of aging-associated disease. It just stabilizes it. Right. So the idea is if if my basic lifestyle advice, let's say it stabilizes your aging process at the age of 60. Right. My age right now. Right. That doesn't mean I go down to a zero risk of heart disease or cancer or any of those things. It just right. means the risk that I have now will stay stable right. for the rest of my life. Right. So let's say on an optimistic scenario, I now have a 15 to 20% chance of contracting a deadly cancer or uh, cardiovascular syndrome. Mm -hmm. Okay. The key thing is we have modern medicine, and modern medicine is awesome right. when you can afford it. And we now have a tremendous ability to cut out cancer. Not all cancers, obviously not brain cancer. Um, but for example, if I get colon cancer, as I might or sometime in the next 10 years, they can excise my entire colon. They can either do a, a reconnection of the normal exit or it can give me, I can uh, have an, uh, what's the term? Uh, osteotomy? I think that's the term. Uh, but where the contents of my uh, GI tract empty into a valve on the side of my abdomen. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay? Not a glamorous way to live, but yeah. you can survive. Yeah. And people live for decades like that. Um, Similarly, if I have a dilating blood vessel, um, many of those dilating blood vessels, which risk complete explosion and bleed out, can be repaired. Um, you know, with pretty traumatic, you know, cardiovascular surgery. Mm. But if if I stay as robust as somebody in their uh, late forties, let's say. I can survive that, all right? Right. Um, and by stay, that means that when I'm 75 and I have an aneurysm, they could patch it and have me survive. Right. Okay? If I remain robust because of the diet and lifestyle transition. Right. So that's what gets lots of people like yourself to live to 110, 120, 130 because the odds leaving aside medicine, are reasonable, and you add medicine to that package, right. and you get repaired when bad things happen to you, and you can survive the repair. You, you come out of the OR right. a lot right. with the working brain. That's when you get people routinely living to be centenarians, yeah. which is what I forecast for someone your age, which I'm guessing is around 40, um, maybe 35. 36, yes. All right. Yes. Okay. Sorry about the bud 40. No worries. Uh, <laughs> I'm not easily offended. <laughs> uh, so, frankly, for you, that's all the better. Because I would feel very confident that you could be a centenarian, assuming you don't hang around gangland nightclubs or drive dangerously on freeways. I mean, I guess uh, I bring that, I brought that up, Michael, because, um, like, at what point now do we, do we know that aging stops in humans? Like, if is it 90 or 100 or 120? Do we, okay. do we know that? You know what I mean? That, thank you for that question because uh, there's a very important lifestyle-related detail which perfectly illustrates my point of view, which is that Americans on a nasty agriculture, well, worse than agricultural, supermarket Twinkies and soda diet right. don't stop aging in the early 90s. Mm -hmm. They don't stop aging until they're over 100. I see. That's what I mean, yeah. Yes. So the Gavrilovs have done some great data analysis on Americans living in the 20th century, the century literally of Coca-Cola and Twinkies, yeah. 
and many other food products, yeah. which will completely ruin your health compared to an organic agricultural diet. Right. So my advice comes in two, fla- two stages. Right. At any and every age, do not eat what they want you to eat based on the television commercials and the center aisles of the supermarket. Right. That is destructive for that's everybody. That's a good rule. I like that. The center aisles, yeah. That's a good center one. Center aisles. Avoid yeah. the center aisles. Shop in the periphery. Yeah. Um, and when you're uh, over 40, you should make the paleo transition. Right now, Jeremy, you know, you look like you're reasonably lean and in good shape. Okay. You can equivocate about this for the next five years. You okay. can spend another five years reading my publications. And by the way, we have experimental data on this yeah. coming out in Fruit Flies where we've got a similar dietary switch mm. experiment, evolutionary switch yeah. to the human story, which I'd be happy to talk about once it's published. Um, so, you know, you make your transition when you're 41 or 42, right. you know, you have your last cake your last spaghetti dinner (laughs) and then you go on a different aging trajectory much slower right and sometime around the age of 70 your aging stops and you're as robust as a present day 50 something yeah and then medicine is awesome and we're really good at repairing your cardiovascular lesions and your cancer and you will coast past 100 right without any fear yeah yeah I mean, what sticks out in my head again is um, like what you said, at what point can we make that stopping age instead of at 70 or 60 or 50, but at 30, Okay. you know, and then that nanotechnology, no. okay. you know what I mean? Uh, not, certainly not in my lifetime, probably not in yours. Mm-hmm. Uh, by 2100, I think we'll be stopping aging earlier, mm-hmm. which means we'll be living, once we succeed in stopping aging, at the physio at, at a chronological age of 35 yeah, right. 36 your age right people routinely live centuries mm. okay yeah with a, I, like you said medicine catching up with whatever 3d printing yes. of organs and nanotechnology exactly. cleaning up the arteries and things exactly. like that exactly yeah. because once you stop aging early then the world of Aubrey de Grey starts to become relevant because repairing whatever problems you have is obviously the way to go. Right. The problem Aubrey faces is that damage and repair have nothing to do with the underlying aging trajectory. That has to do with evolution. Yeah, yeah. Um, Sorry, Aubrey. No, Aubrey that's... comes in later in the story. Yeah, and then at that point you think that dietary, you know, the diet is enough. Like, like you said in... X number of years when we stop aging at 35 or 40, do you think the stopping aging, uh, the diet is going to be enough to, to get to that point? No, 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 no. So right now, and indefinitely in the future, I predict, you won't be able to do much better than stopping aging in your late 60s through right. diet and lifestyle alone. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Getting, pushing the age at which aging stops to earlier ages requires the kind of massive genomic analysis that we're going to be doing over the next 50 to 70 years in the bulk of this 21st century. Yeah. I'll be dead before that's done. I'm very confident. Okay. Once that's done, however, we'll be routinely stopping aging around your age mm-hmm. and then indefinitely repairing you Right. so that Somebody who turns 35 or 36 in the year 2100 could easily live 300 or 400 years. That's what I'm suggesting. Yeah, yeah. Well, I can go on and on and on for 36 hours probably, and I would, I would challenge you for that. But um, I know you have to go. So um, where can people find you? Where should people go to find out more? Go to the website 55theses, T H E S E S uh, dot org. You can also just go Michael Rose Aging, three words, and that website will turn out in your top 10 hits where I explain everything I've said to you step by step. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Michael, it's been an absolute pleasure. And if you're ever open to talking about the origin of life and the evolution of sex, I am oh. definitely. Uh, Anytime. Open Anytime, to just it. not today. <laughs> and, uh, you know, thank you so much again. I really appreciate it. My pleasure, Jeremy. All right. Bye. What I got, you can't buy. It resides.
between my eyes Walked through the fire Came out better on the other side See, life's like a beach If you find the sand And right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand 